Good afternoon. Uh, so today I wanted to uh, just start out the conversation with uh, what we're doing on Friday. So as Lauren mentioned, um, I'm Chris Hansen. I'm the Senior Digital uh, Director at Fridays. I've been at Fridays for about three years overseeing customer experience and uh, most recently all of digital uh, at Fridays. And so when we think about um, creepy versus personalization versus all the things that we're trying to do, right? You can't start anywhere with AI without data, with a ton of data. We're an old company, 65 years uh, uh, plus. Uh, and, and so when we think about that, we think about all of our customers who've come in, done dining with us online, offline, in stores. And so you know what we know about our customers starts to come clear when we talk about all the data we get, right? So here I'm showing, you know, an example of, let's just call it me, right? I am, here's, here's my habits at Fridays, right? Uh, I eat out a lot. Um, I, I like Buffalo Wild Wings, I, yeah, or Buffalo Wild Wings, wrong, sorry brand. <laughs> Boneless wings, um, mozzarella sticks, ribs, um, but if you look at this, there's a trend, right? And, and the first thing we have to do when we think about our data and, and cleansing it and, and all the different things around AI is, you know, let's make sure it, it makes sense and let's identify a problem that we have. And so uh, I order a lot on Friday for Fridays. Um, and when we think about that and we start to look at what we're going to do to personalize and, and really help our customers from an experience perspective, um, we start to see you know, things that we can do, right? That on Fridays, around six o'clock, you always order boneless wings. Not always, but most of the time. And so what does that do for us? What, what kind of interaction can we create from a customer perspective that will allow me to better personalize your experience? And so I see it Friday, six o'clock, boneless wings, and the following Friday, I get a text message. I get some kind of communication that says, hey, now my name's not Gretchen, but Gretchen, it's Friday. How about an order of boneless wings to get started? And of course, we go back and forth. You know, you read my mind. Yeah, let's do this. Th this is just one example of, of how at Fridays we're taking technology and using the data that we have to make something a little bit more personable, but also aligning all of those things with our KPIs, right? You can't do much of this unless you look at it from a, I, I have a very customer focused lens based off my background, but identifying a problem um, tying it to our business goals, and then finding how the technology will help me solve that problem. So we've been doing this on and off. Um, there's obviously a past, present, and future kind of thought process when it comes to all this technology. Um, these are some of the things we've done in the past. Um, some of this is very much futuristic, and some is, is, is present. But just to give you a little bit of, of context with the technology, um, Using AI and using machine learning and, and, and taking our data, you know, we have obviously seen tremendous opportunity and growth, right? 500% uh, increase in, in guest engagement on social, um, using bots, using different opportunities there. Um, online revenue, so I oversee majority of that. How do we you know, really grow that from a perspective of reordering and, and other opportunities? Um, open rates and email, right? So. All of the data that we're taking, we're using to parse through it, uh, find the uh, segments that we can, do the testing, uh, and really grow our results time over time, so, uh, or year over year. So that's a little bit about what we're doing at Fridays. Um, I'm going to have a seat and see awesome. what's next. Thank you. Um, we, thanks so much, Chris. Great. I guess standing over here. So, uh, hi, my name is Jessica Lax. I'm the VP of Analytics at DoorDash. Uh, I've been at DoorDash uh, five years, actually just celebrated my five-year Dash anniversary this past Sunday, so very exciting. Um, 
So at, at, at DoorDash for us, the, the goal of personalization is really to improve the, the consumer experience. And so everything that we do is, is in that vein. All of the testing that we're doing is ultimately to um, reduce friction, improve conversion, retention, engagement for our consumers. Um, we actually started um, the, oh, I think the slides went, this one, there we go. We actually started our personalization journey a few years ago, starting with uh, very similar to actually what Chris was talking about, email reminders to reorder something that you had actually ordered in the past. Uh, so similar to the, to the example that was just given, people tend to be very habitual when it comes to their ordering behavior. Uh, speaking again, just for me, I tend to order the exact same thing on Saturday afternoons from the same restaurant every week. Uh, and so a lot of consumers are similar to me in that regard. And so we started sending email reminders to kind of order it again um, as a simple way to stay top of mind for our, uh, for our consumers. Uh, and these emails, as you can see from some of the results uh, in A-B testing compared to a baseline uh, popular restaurant email, saw an improvement in not just the click to open rates, but also in conversion. And so this was an early signal that just using averages or overall popular restaurants was not nearly as effective as getting you know, more personal to what consumer preferences are. Um, so a lot of our personalization actually started in, uh, in the email channel as a good way to run simple tests and get some results that we could then use to build upon in-app. So from there, the journey changed not just from uh, reordering something that you've already ordered, but to try and better predict what types of restaurants uh, a consumer might like. So we wanted to actually build a model at the consumer level for a consumer store pair, where we would predict the probability of conversion. And for the restaurants that had a high probability of conversion, that's what we would show to our consumers. And so um, we built a model that considers store attributes, um, consumer preferences, things like price, obviously cuisine affinity, um, and also some latent information about stores using vector embedding. So many of you might be familiar with a popular deep learning algorithm, word to vec uh, We built a similar model called store to vec which did the same things uh, that word to vec does with words for stores or for restaurants. Um, and so this enabled us to understand that you know, if you like this particular Indian restaurant, you also likely like this particular Thai restaurant. And we could use that information to suggest restaurants that were relevant to consumers. And so uh, using this model, we again through email, tried suggesting restaurants for consumers that we thought that they would like and saw really great success rates in both click to open rates as well as conversion rates. Uh, and so this really laid the foundation for what we wanted to build in-app. And so there's a number of different areas within our consumer app where personalization could really help consumers to reduce friction and therefore increase conversion. So first, at the top, you see those different cuisine icons. Um, so one of the tests that we um, are actually still iterating on is to actually sort these cuisine icons based on individual consumer preference. So this is actually a screenshot of my app uh, in one of the treatment groups. And you can tell from my sad every Saturday around lunchtime, I love to order sandwiches. I also love to order pizza. I'm from New York. I guess you, can't take a, you can take a girl out of New York, but not her eating habits. So these are my different um, cuisine icon sort, uh, sort order based on my past uh, ordering behavior. But there are similar opportunities to use personalization both within the different carousels. So SF team picks first order $0 delivery fee are part of our carousel real estate. We want to be able to personalize this carousel real estate so that the first few uh, stores that you see are the ones that we believe you are most likely to convert on. And then similarly, down below this carousel real estate, we have our general store feed. And there's opportunities there as well, uh, using what we know about consumers, uh, using what we know about um, past ordering behavior and similar types of consumer preferences, 
we're able to intelligently sort these different areas uh, and show the most relevant content, thereby improving conversion. So um, there's a ton of opportunity that we're constantly testing through. We don't have results yet because we're still iterating on a number of these experiments. Um, but it's a really big opportunity to help consumers to discover what they want to order, um, especially if they don't have or if they don't know already. And of course, for those who do know already and personalization may not be um, as impactful, you always want to have a very easy to access search. Um, search button so that people can search exactly for what they want um, if it's not something that is already top of the list. Uh, if your palms aren't sweating, they should because Lauren just starts calling randomly from the crowd after me. <laughs> and then you just got to come up here and tell your story. Hey, uh, thanks uh, for letting me talk a little bit about personalization because it's something that's really core to the iHeartRadio vision. It's something aspirationally that we have been working toward and we're, we're striving toward um, being a real pillar of what we're known for um, in our consumer relationship. So first step, your vision statement. We spent months and months pouring over a really um, aspirational background picture. We finally found one, and then we spent about an hour crafting some language. Uh, I just wanted to introduce you to what it is that we're trying to accomplish. We want to enrich our users' lives by presenting the entire universe of audio as a personalized experience, prioritizing the content they love the most. It's a lot of words, but I want you to imagine a funnel, the entire universe of audio at the very top of it. I'm talking about tens of millions of songs, millions of artists, thousands of radio stations, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of podcasts, etc. All of that there, the paradigm of choice, the paralysis of trying to figure out what I want to listen to next. And our job is to be our user's audio companion and help them sort through, sift through all that with what we know about them, what we know they like, the habits, their tastes, their uh, listening location, all of that. And ultimately, I distill our vision statement down into something I think is far more human and far more simple. So when I talk to my team and I want them to be able to wrap their head around someone walking up to them and saying, what do you do and why do you do it? I want them to say, I work for the audio, our audio service is the one that gets me. I Heart Radio, we want it to be the audio service that gets me. When somebody opens our app, I want the content that we present to them to be the content that's most relevant, that's contextualized the best. As they finish listening to a podcast series, I just wrapped up listening to Dr. Death, and I want at the end of that for iHeartRadio to say, oh wow, you like Dr. Death, you've gotta check out Dirty John next, and the person to listen to go, nailed it. Great recommendation. It's a Saturday and you're looking for a chill playlist. I want us to have curated the perfect chill playlist for you based on the type of music that we know that you love, based on where we know that you live, and for you to go through that playlist and go, wow, you guys nailed it. You're looking for a radio station. I want you to look in there and based on the music that you like and the location and the morning show that you listen to, to the one that we recommend to you to be the most relevant. And over time, we build companionship with our users by building trust of getting it right and getting it right and getting it right. How many times will you take a bad movie recommendation from a good friend of yours? Twice? By the third one, you just kind of pat them on the head and you move along? How many times will you let somebody recommend a bad restaurant to you before the next one you just absolutely ignore? So that's what we're working to, is building trust by getting it right over and over and over again. And that's challenging. It's something that obviously we have to plug in and start to rely on machine learning to be able to scale that in kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. But I wanted to show the byproduct of the times that we have gotten it right. So just a couple of quick metrics of where we have landed on that moment where the person has said, wow, you got me. You guys understood me. So we worked long and hard. We kind of did the human versus machine uh, age-old experiment. And we started building a machine learning personalized Rex engine that took a look at all the cues that we knew about you and said, can we do a better job of recommending podcasts for you than a trending chart or than the, um, the list that we had our podcast experts come up with? And it took a long time and the machine lost over and over and over and over again until one day it didn't. And the day that it didn't and it started getting better and better, what we started seeing was that people who listen to podcasts from the recommendations engine wound up retaining far more than people who were listening to podcasts that were being recommended through other channels because the other channels weren't getting it right as frequently. And the more often you get it right, the greater trust you build, and the more that companionship grows between us and our users. So if you listen to one of the machine learning podcast recom recommended podcasts, 
then your likelihood of coming back increased 45% over the other ways that you might have discovered podcasts. Two other quick examples. We created a playlist for users called Your Weekly Mixtape. Again, this is based on all the indicators that we knew about the taste, uh, your taste profile, the types of music that you like, the times that you listen to, the radio stations that you listen to, the podcasts that you listen to, everything that we know about you. And we started putting together a weekly personalized playlist for users. And we found that the more and more we got it right, the byproduct of that was that users who were subscribers to one of our on-demand services had a higher retention rate because we built up greater trust with them. And then one last one, the My Favorites Radio. This one's not machine learning driven this is actually one where we just take implicit cues from the audience just as they're navigating through the app we do the work for them every time they saw a thumb a song up we go ahead and we shuffle that off and build a playlist for them of all of the songs that they have thumbed up it means it requires no more work for them they don't have to go in and search find the song add it to the playlist and do all of that they just go about their business kind of a lean back listening experience and as they are interacting with the app we go ahead and we do the work for them so that the next time they come back in there's this personalized listening experience waiting for them. We've collected all the songs that we noticed that you like. Hopefully that wasn't too creepy for you because we've made this radio station out of that information. And the result of that is that it's the highest return visit station that we have in the app. 45 to 50% is an incredibly high retention rate for somebody listening to a piece of audio on one day and coming back to consume that same piece of audio the next day. So what we found is the more we're able to get it right, the more a person opens the app and goes, ah, you guys get me, that the byproduct is the trust that we build brings them back over and over and over again. And the tie back into the machine learning conversation is that it's challenging to do, it's challenging to scale if you wanna get those recommendations to start to become one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one instead of here's a cohort recommendation, you kind of fall into this bucket. So we, this generally uh, should appeal to this bucket. The more we get one to one to one, the higher return we see on that. And so the, the, the ML is really a requirement for us to be able to scale to that level. That's awesome, thank you. Um, that was super helpful. I, I think one of the things we were talking about earlier this week, as we were all kind of prepping, getting to know each other, was just you brought it up this concept of like self-fulfilling prophecy you know so you've balanced this these machine learning algorithms that are supposed to get really really good at predicting what you like but then also balancing that with the element of discovery so how are you guys you talked a lot about experimentation like how are each of you guys trying to balance those elements i don't just go start with you yeah so one of the things that we've noticed um, in, within our app is that the, the stores that are in the top positions so the stores that are most visible tend to get the most orders whether or not they are inherently more popular so as you start to surface recommendations for consumers uh, you know, how do you know that you're not actually causing these stores to be ordered from because you're showing them more right so one of the ways that we do this obviously is through testing if you can ha if you have a b test you have a control group that's not necessarily seeing that same algorithm you can actually compare um, but we've also looked at you know other areas of real estate where we may or may not be testing uh, some of our um, machine learning algorithms to understand what that what that latent behavior is so uh, what is store popularity through um, through for example um, direct search right and does that store popularity and that ranking actually match with what we're seeing with behavior and so um, we're most dependent on experimentation to get signals um, because you, you definitely don't want to create um, a sort of circle or a cycle where you are seeing really great results, but you are causing those really great results, and it's not that your your algorithm is actually better. Um, that would that would that would be a fail <laughs> for us. Chris. Yeah, I, I think testing is has to be a platform or the foundation of everything that you do. Um, you know, it's easy to say I can go take this data and, and just do something with it, but if you're not challenging everything you do through testing, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hard miss, right? So, you know, what, at Fridays, you know, in any food restaurant, really, I mean, we go out and test menu items every day. We test them in all different markets, and so the same shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't discount the same kind of methodology when it comes to using our data. And so we're constantly running tests uh, to understand and we we like DoorDash uh, from a restaurant perspective and and even food perspective you know we see the top 10 food and it shifts every once in a while but you know we have to challenge that methodology um, so you know don't try and boil the ocean just try and you know start small and, and do some small stuff so 
next Chris. Other Chris. Next. <laughs> the danger of personalization is that you wind up narrowing down the scope of what a person is even able to understand your product offers. So you wind up finding that a person likes a specific type of content, a specific type of food, a specific type of audio feature, and you start really customizing and personalizing it down to where they are winding up getting a very narrow sliver of what your product offers. And I think we've probably all been in a really bad Rex environment where over time you go, I don't, this feels very narrow and very stifling and it actually starts to become boring over time. That's the real challenge of personalization is that you can overdo it. Human um, in the loop helps to kind of keep that from happening because editorialization allows us to come in, make recommendations, tell stories. I think as long as that's being contextualized in the right way. Hey, here's something that we're recommending for you because it aligns with a holiday, because it aligns with some pop culture moment, because there is some tangential reason why we think this might be relevant for you. It makes sure that your uh, feedback cycle, it, the data that you're getting back from the user is being refreshed constantly, and it's giving that user a breath of fresh air so that they're able to also explore other things. I think also understanding context is really important. So while I may want to listen to and eat certain things on a Friday, that's very different than what I want to do on a Sunday. The music that I want to listen to in the morning or the content that I want to listen to in the morning is going to be very different than the content I want to listen to on Saturday night before I'm going out. And so to understand context uh, as well is really important to try to make sure that you're forcing a little bit of expansion uh, in the recommendations that you're offering and the personalization that you're offering so it doesn't become so narrow cast. So we only got about a minute left and I kind of want to jump to just everybody's at a little bit different parts of their journey, right? You guys probably all started in a little bit different areas. If you had to go back and you had a hindsight 2020 moment, um, what do you wish you knew or maybe who did you wish you involved or what would you tell other people that are just at, at different stages of their journey about how to approach personalization and, and get to the places that you guys are now? You want to start next, Chris? Oh, great. I'll jump on that. <laughs> I wish I'd started um, sooner it's because it's daunting and, and you, it, there are shortcuts to, to getting there that you can just um, go at it with brute force and, and, and just move along. Um, and so it's easy, I think, a lot of times just to brute force your way along and you find that you've lost the benefit of time. So getting there faster and getting in and, and, and we've cratered more. I mean, it takes like 300 times to get any of those results. I was talking to somebody earlier. I was like, I, obviously, I only showed the ones that made it look like we came up with smart things. I didn't show the ones where we drove off 50% of a, of a test group because it was just an absolute disaster of an algorithm. Um, but so we have all of these craters that led up to a, a singular success. So the faster you can work your way through your craters, uh, the, the faster you can get to your successes. So I wish, I'd, I wish we had started that process earlier instead of brute forcing it. Jessica? Yeah, so I think sort of my advice would be to, to start simple. I think that a lot of people tend to want to start using really fancy algorithms and um, may not even have a lot of data to work with. And uh, there's a lot that you can learn just based on simple rules, uh, simple rules, um, based on user behavior, based on averages and popularity. And I think that there's a lot of improvement that can be made in a really simplistic way that actually doesn't involve you know, a, a ton of machine learning or you know, AI. And I would say to start there. Start small, see those early wins, and then build upon that. And as you collect more data, um, as your, your company grows and your audience grows, then you can start to get more advanced and to start to optimize. But uh, a lot of the early wins we had were just um, using sort of common sense, thinking about our own user behavior and applying that to, to our, our consumer audience. And we were able to see some really big wins uh, pretty quickly in a, in a pretty simple manner before we started to get more involved and more complex. Yeah, that's good advice. <sighs> Jeez, now I got to answer after that. Um, so definitely echo those two things, but I think the, the, the biggest and foremost is know the, answer, know the question you're trying to answer. You know, figure out what you're trying to do because then you can fail fast and you can do the small stuff, but if you're trying to solve something that's not really the problem, um, you're going to it's, you're gonna fail and you're never gonna get past those failures. So um, know the problem you're trying to do. Is it a customer problem or is it a business problem? Um, ideally from the customer guy, I, I mean, I, you should be solving the customer's issues that align to business goals, 
not the other way around. Um, because if you're just trying to solve business problems uh, through this, sometimes you'll succeed, but you won't su succeed as far if you can get your customers to, to do what they, uh, what they want on the flip side. So, Awesome, Chris, Jessica, Chris, thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.